Okay, is it? That's perfect, yes. Thank Excellent. you. Thank you. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Rebecca Coley. I'm Head of Planning and Development at Traffic Council. Um, I'm going to talk to you a bit about our code today, which is actually a code that's been produced by DM officers for DM. So we have a little bit of a different take on it as well. Um, for those of you who don't know, this is where Trafford is. Um, it's a metropolitan unitary borough. It forms the south western part of Greater Manchester. It's one of the 10 Greater Manchester authorities. Uh, and we have, with, with nine of the others, just adopted the Places for Everyone uh, joint development plan. So we do have an up-to-date development plan. Um, we are one of the, the Pathfinder authorities, uh, and we have produced a digital first and borough-wide code, uh, and alongside that, a master plan for specific areas as well, which I'll, I'll come down onto later. Um, Trafford is famous for sport. We have both the old Traffords, um, but football and cricket, they're on the same road. Our office is smack bang in the middle of them, um, but that, that brings it, it, its own pressures. We're at the moment anticipating the conclusions of the Old Trafford Task Force, um, which postdates some of the work I'll show you later, as, as it will be a huge opportunity and somewhere the, the design code can go in the future, I think. Um, we've also got Altrincham as our main town and with Altrincham Market and, and Stratford up in the north of the borough is, is regenerating. Um, a borough-wide code for us was a huge challenge. Um, we are effectively a transect through a conurbation. You've got high density, high rise development up near the regional centre. Um, you've got um, rural areas. You've got a load of suburbs. You've got Trafford Park, which is a massive industrial area. Um, so you've got almost every type of landscape and townscape character you could ask for apart from coasts, I think. Um, so we've we've had to code with that in mind, really. Um, so the project team was split between us and, and Capita. Um, it wasn't an in-house code in terms of the fact that we wrote all the content. So we wrote the words. Um, and we wrote the words as a, as a development management team as well. Um, it's been drafted entirely by officers from, from our DM service. I mean, not we're not necessarily case officers from day to day anymore. I'm certainly not, although I was one. Um, and we had an officer seconded entirely onto the project for, for 18 months. But we've all dealt with planning applications uh, on, on the front line throughout our, our professional lives, um, which which brings us from a, di from a different place, I think. Um, in terms of the digital platform, that was designed and implemented by Capita, and in particular, um, Dan Bulmer, who um, is the technical brains be behind the platform, but he's also an urban designer, which was really useful because he understood what a code sh should do and, 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 and how it should work. And he's also responsible for much of the Wharfside master plan. Sorry, my slides aren't moving on. I don't know why. Ah, yes, there we go. Um, so our starting point was what were the challenges we were facing in development management in Trafford? What 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 problems did we need to solve? What did a code need to do for us? Um, and we started by writing everything down that we have these recurring issues that we needed to think about. Um, most of our issues uh, effectively lead from inflated land value expectation. People are paying far, far too much for land. I mean, seriously too much land for land. Smaller sites, five times more than a benchmark land value would would indicate that they're worth. Um, and that leads to things like maximisation rather than optimisation, everything being built out to the side boundary, um, poor cramped layout, layouts, acontextual heights and forms, um, proportions being wrong, being too close to neighbours, um, building a building on stilts on a car park because you're trying again trying to maximize what, what you get very little landscaping very little articulation um, and and poor quality materials so moving on from that we were thinking about how how and why applications are refused but actually more importantly where you might want to refuse an application but you can't quite articulate why what what is wrong with it what what what's the tools that you need to articulate what is wrong with that application, what the harm is, and how does that wording kind of affect the enforceability of of what you're trying to do as well? You know, if you go if you are dealing with retrospective applications and you want them to be made better and and improvements to be made on site, you need to be able to articulate that through through a notice. And what will give you the greatest results for the least effort? What 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 is an issue over and over and over again? And that's that's what we 
we started with. So uh, I'll just speak very briefly about our code itself. Um, it's designed to be digital first. We wrote it onto a spreadsheet um, and then it was um, pasted directly into the digital platform. You can generate a PDF out of it, um, but that isn't the product. The product is the digital um, platform um, and you can provide a text only version. You will need that um, because you, your members need to adopt a tangible thing. They can't adopt a website. They need to adopt a document. Um, so that's something to bear in mind. Um, it has been, been important as well because the spreadsheet has allowed flexibility in drafting the code. And certainly in terms of now we're between consultation draft and final draft, um, that we have a kind of shadow website and, underneath that nobody can get to, um, but which has the nearly final version of the code. And on adoption, we will just swap them over. Um, we, will, we will make that one live and we will take the other one down. Um, so the code's quite lengthy. It is 268 pages as a PDF, but the, the digital platform allows conditional logic. You can just go through and look at the code you need, um, but you could read it to cover, to cover if you wanted to. Uh, you can click on any one of those icons and that will take you to a different area of the code and then through it thereafter. Um, the code is also fairly, uh, fully searchable. Everything is indexed so that um, it can be referenced and particularly it can be referenced in officer reports because you need to, to be able to refer back to the code that you are referring to when you're saying whether there's compliance or not. Um, but unlike a paper document, only each one of those tabs on the code. So you've got code, what is the code description, uh, which is effectively the why, why the code is needed and then compliance, how you comply with it. You only see one of those at once, but it reduces the text that you need to consider immediately and makes the, the pages simpler. Um, and the codes are also illustrated with diagrams and interactive tools. I'll just come on to a bit about how we've been using it in the application process now and, and what, what we've been seeing um, as the code has, has come into to being and, and has got closer to adoption. Um, it's definitely had a positive effect on, on design out, outcomes, including with, with um, house builders who are more used to putting forward standard product. Uh, the scheme you see on the left there in the picture originally came in as um, a 37 unit scheme on a standard suburban layout with standard suburban type house types, the sort of thing that's being submitted up and down the country all the time. Um, we refused that and we refused it on design grounds because that is not a suburban site. Um, and it was not an appropriate design response and the applicant could not believe it. Uh, we have never had a refusal on design grounds ever. Um, they were absolutely outraged and then we won the appeal and uh, you know their, um, their heads nearly exploded. Um, but then we got to with them, they came back, they worked with us, they worked really well with us. Uh, got a decent architect in, really thought about it, got a very good landscape architect in and got a landscape-led development and ended up getting um, more units on the site. So the original the, the original one was for 37 and this one that you see on the screen is for 57. So the, the yield of that site when it was thought about in a different way and in a more urban fashion actually got them more units and more floor, floor space and therefore more value. Um, and the starting point we're seeing is, is getting higher, applicants are becoming more familiar with the code, they know what's expected of them, um, there, there is an attempt to, to address the code from, from the start rather than, oh, here's my application, uh, but we've got a design code and you need to do this and you're miles off, it, it, is, it is better. Um, and again, good local architects don't have to be local, but people who understand the context they're doing. Um, as I say, we're seeing street tree provision, landscaping improving, layouts becoming better, proportions better, and also beginning to see much shorter timescales because there's a clarity of expectation, doesn't need so many revisions, uh, the certainty about what's required, um, and, and that's making applications not take as long. And we're winning appeals, even though it's not adopted yet, just on the principles that are in, in the code because we've got, the, the National Design Guide and we've got the MPPF 
uh, and we've got an emerging code and that is enough to and as long again as the, the harm is properly articulated that is enough to win appeals um, so just thought I'd show you this this is the same scheme as on, on the other on the other slide but just this is their design and access statement and the application number is there uh, and the link to our if you want to go and have a look at this this was the first real design and access statement that came forward with the design code in mind um, so the architects worked through it looked at every every relevant code and then has, has done a page in their design and access statement basically which reflects what that code requires and how that they their response to that particular code um, and here we, we see a, a slightly different um, part of it where they're looking at, at proportion and elevation and articulation uh, and taking that context and then looking at that and seeing how that then fits together and the output of that with materials as well is a context led building form um, which you can see on that slide there so so that's been very successful and that application was granted by planning committee a couple of weeks ago uh, and planning committee were really really keen on this um, it, even though it wasn't it, it was a new type of of development they could see exactly how it was being influenced by the code they were absolutely over the moon by all the accessibility um, uh, things that have been included in it all the dwellings were um, m42 for example um, and they were really positive about it so um, really easy to get through planning committee unanimous approval which was which is also a benefit okay I'll just speak a little bit now about um, where we've been dealing with it in what I'm calling here pre pre app and pre app um, pre pre app is I'm sure you all know what it is somebody comes in just wants a quick chat half an hour before they go into you know what 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 are the principal issues we'll do we'll do that and then they will go into our paid pre app process if they think they've got enough certainty from from that um, and where we've been doing a lot of that is with our Wolfside master plan um, the Wolfside master plan is a specific section of the design code and it seeks to apply the, the uh, code concepts and parameters to an area of the borough which we do expect to undergo transformational change um, 5,000 or more new residential units um, lots of high density development lots of high-rise buildings um, the if you can see my cursor I'm not sure whether you can um, that's Manchester United there and this came forward before the um, the the task force ideas or even before uh, any of the discussions about uh, the new ownership and so on so it doesn't necessarily reflect that um, but even without that and it does leave that area blank for the moment it it has always been an area of significant interest and a real opportunity and there's always been lots of developer interest in in the sites and there is a development framework as well which sits above the master plan and gives a, a higher level uh, view of of what's going on there. Um, so there's lots of developers who who s seek high level conversations about that. Who've been coming in, um, asking about what what they might get on on sites. We've been always been really keen to make sure that the this area works as a whole, as a coherent skyline and a coherent place, rather than a number of speculative developments which don't necessarily really relate to one another. Um, but in a way that means that the market can bring them forward rather than us having to CPO um, a load of the land. We've already CPO'd it once in the 80s uh, when it was part of the Trafford Park Development Corporation. We don't really want to have to do it again. Um, and I don't think we will need to. If we look at this next slide, you will see all those red lines um, in and around that slide. Each of those red lines represents a land ownership boundary. Um, and each of the land ownership boundaries can be brought forward independently in accordance with the master plan as part of the whole. That's been a very deliberate um, effort on our part to make those plots work as in individual plots to come forward uh, as and when the market would suggest that they should. Um, and this is a heights plan here that we're using to guide pre-app. Heights do have 
flexibility, but the, it's the general concept of concentrating height on the waterfront and around the central part of the, the area, that's, that's fixed. Um, and this one shows how each of the plots on Wolfside is broken down into a series of parameter plans. Uh, this is one way a site may be developed, um, either within fixed or target parameters. It's one of the par these parameter plans for each of the plots. Um, it explains which are fixed, which are indicative, but if the, the vision of the master plan is, is realised that this is that's the ambition overall, um, and the and the wharfside master plan is also part of the suite of, of documents. So yeah. in doing a borough wide code, it's become increasingly ob obvious that you can't code for a whole borough in the way that a design code is is described, or in the way that the national model de design code suggests that you do. That's just impossible. It would be a life's work to try and do that. So what you do is you do your kind of overall borough-wide guidance, identify your area types, and then then uh, drill down where you can. So for example, in Wharfside, and we expect our um, development plan allocations in place for everyone to also, uh, they will be master planned and, and that those master plans can become part of the code. And then you could go right down to site-specific areas if you, if you wanted to, it isn't. I don't think a borough wide code will ever be a code for every street in the borough. It just it just can't be that. Um, we're also working at the moment on bringing forward our compliance checklist, um, which we'll adopt as part of the planning val application validation checklist later in the year. We have had some feedback that compliance checklists can have unintended consequences, i.e., people just tick that they've complied with it um, and haven't. Um, and it, it's almost to try and reverse that is difficult. So we're considering carefully how that might work. Cause we'd, we want to be, we, the code requires judgment and that needs to remain. Um, but it, what we do want to do is reduce the number of issues for discussion during an application and also use it as a, as a bit of a design training tool for, for officers. Um, it has, has to work like that, not as a way for applicants to claim they've complied with the code when they haven't and also um, a perennial issue in DM is if a, a developer puts forward a scheme and um, we say, okay, this issue's fine, this issue's fine, and this issue's fine, we move on, this issue isn't fine. Um, they try and fix that issue, but they cause an issue in <laughs> that you already have, have resolved. They say, well, you didn't have any issue with that. Well, no, we didn't on your previous, but you can't go back on what you've previously said. Yeah, but you've changed your scheme. So we, you know, and you, you've all, you will have all had that. Um, so just not going in those those circles where they say, well, you know, you've already said you, we comply with the scheme there, so it doesn't really matter if we change our scheme. You can't now tell us we don't. Um, so I think that's just something to be a bit cautious with because we get we get that all the time because they just do not want to reduce quantum at all. Um, just summarise what's next for us. Um, We've done our viability consultation. We're collating and responding to that. Um, we've had some useful responses to that in terms of actual costs from um, what we're calling the apartment builders, um, less from, from others. Um, as I said before, we're doing our final amendments away and on the mirror, to, mirror platform. Uh, and once that's ready to go, we can just swap them over. Uh, we're going to go and have a look at some modern methods of construction to see what we can uh, take into account for that in the code and then um, this was going to be July we, we adopted but unfortunately the second pre-election period on the bounce has meant that that's now got to be September um, but with the exception of the Wharfside master plan which needs to wait um, to see what happens around Manchester United and it will be a supplementary planning document um, we're confident that should give it enough weight one because there's no alternative at the moment um, without supplementary plans being in, in law um, and you have the MPPF saying that, that local design codes should be given significant weight. And uh, we're seeing that from inspectors anyway, saying, well, you know, even with our householder guidance, which dates from, I don't know, years and years ago, um, the inspectors are dealing with that as a design code and giving it significant weight. So um, we do think it will have the weight that it needs, even if that's not the same as development plan policy. So just at the end of there, uh, some links for you to have a look at if you're interested. But otherwise, thank you very much for listening. Thanks, Beth.